He's born in 1711 here in Edinburgh, but he spends most of his boyhood south of here in the Berwickshire Hills in the family farmhouse. His father dies very young. He's a middle son, has to find himself a profession. So he's back here in Edinburgh at the ripe old age of 13 at the university studying law. The only problem is, as he puts it himself just here, he has an insurmountable aversion to everything but the pursuit of philosophy and general learning. In other words, he likes to read books. So home he goes, plonks himself down in his bedroom and just sits there reading books. And not just the odd book, the lot. He reads the whole of Western philosophy, as it was then understood. Lots of clever talk of logic and reason, but it's a bit bloodless. There's nothing about everyday life, not the experiences of looking and feeling and smelling, and for Hume to get a true understanding of knowledge, he decides to plonk man right at the middle of the study of knowledge. Put man in the middle. That's the thing. But how best to conduct that proper study? Instead of looking to old books or scripture, Hume is determined to apply the experimental method of Isaac Newton. Now, Newton uses it for optics and natural science. David Hume determines to use it for mankind. From the age of 18, he's using himself as a kind of perpetual experiment, analysing his own reactions and emotions, doing things like starving himself of food to try to gauge the effect of appetite on the brain. The first question that he really wants to answer is, where do we get knowledge from? Not from some hidden library inside ourselves, but Hume thinks from outside, which means our senses, sight, touch, smell and sound. Only after that does the mind organise and file and connect information. To watch the process, Hume has to watch himself watching. He has to listen to himself listening. It's not such a complicated idea to explain. Let's try again. So, standing here, I can see Edinburgh Castle. And over here is St Giles. These are what Hume calls impressions. All the sights, all the sounds, all the smells pouring into our minds. But what happens to them next? Follow me inside. And so, like one of the numbskulls, here we are inside the brain, which Hume said was empty, remember, except for all the impressions that we'd drunk in from the outside world. If we use the inside of the camera obscura here as a kind of metaphor for the mind, it's easy to understand what Hume was talking about. Now, outside, there were the impressions. And inside, here they are again. There's St Giles. And over here, the castle. And if I knit them together, combine them together, I can create more complicated ideas. The idea, in this case, of Edinburgh. Or the idea, possibly, of a morning in Edinburgh. Or the memory of having lunch with somebody on a morning in Edinburgh. More complicated ideas but based on those simple impressions which constantly bombard my mind. And the knitting together of the simple ideas into more complicated ones is what we call knowledge or thought, all based on those impressions. So far, so good, but can I trust the impressions and therefore the ideas on which I've based everything? No, you can't.